we've been considering Paul's testimony. And Paul, in different places in Scripture, gives his testimony of how he was saved from his sins, how he was born again. And he, he shares about how he was a Pharisee and a leader among the nation of Israel, and that in his passion as a Pharisee, he persecuted the church and Christians, and how God met him and radically confronted him with the person of Jesus Christ, and he was wonderfully saved. And how in, in a pursuit for his pharisaical passions, he also realized that uh, there was sin in his life that he couldn't overcome. That as he began to uh, go before God's word and God's law, he recognized that there was coveting within him. And the more that he tried to overcome his coveting, the worse it got, the worse it became. And you remember one of the stories that one of the times when Paul is telling his story, he, he tells of how Christ confronted him on the road that he is going down to Damascus to persecute the church. And the Lord Jesus spoke to Paul and said, uh, it's hard to kick against the goads. Remember the phrase? Saul's not hard to kick against the goads. And the picture is that Saul's conscience is being pricked and driven and he knows his own sin, but his own response to his sense and awareness of his sinfulness is to double down on his own self-righteous pharisaical efforts to somehow justify himself. And in a passion to justify himself, he's, he's actually turned himself against the very people of God responding to God's message and God's salvation. And God confronts him. And in a moment, Paul sees his sin and Paul confesses and repents. And if we read the story, then God gives Paul a ministry to go to all the nations and preach repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the story of Paul's salvation. But having been saved from his sins and the penalty of his sins in this wonderful, dramatic way, Paul in Romans chapter 7 goes on to teach us that he started out with this desire because his life had changed. He had been transformed. He, he had been given a new heart and a new mind, and with it he wanted to serve God and please Him and honor Him. And, and what he decided to do was, now that his sins had been forgiven and the penalty of his sin had been removed, and he had found himself righteous in his faith in Jesus Christ, he then wanted to live his Christian life out with the strategies he used in the past. He would just begin to once again put together all the disciplines and forge all the ways in which he'd applied his passion and his will and his energies and his pharisaic efforts to be a good person and to show now that he could do it right and he could be better. God had wiped the slate clean and forgiven him of all his sins and now he'd show him what a good Christian he could be by just taking these, these favored these wonderful disciplines that he had learned and he had discovered at the feet of great men of the Jewish faith and he would apply it and prove himself a righteous man. And in Romans chapter 7, what Paul reveals to us is that he failed at it utterly. Failed at it. The more he tried and the more effort he put into it, the greater sin became. The more he realized the struggle of his own body was uh, only fo fomented in his attempt to use his body as the vehicle from which he would prove and use his own natural energies as the means by which he would prove himself now a righteous follower of Jesus Christ. And instead what it did was it just stirred to the surface more and more of his sin. And so as a young believer, he saw that although his mind, he wanted to please God and this new heart and this new mind that God had given him, he wanted to serve God and he wanted to please God that his body was getting the best of him and holding him in captivity. And that's where you come to as you're going through Romans chapter seven, and this creates a tremendous crisis in Paul's life. It's the crisis of this discovery that not only did he not have the power to save himself from the penalty of his sin, but that he had nothing in himself to save himself from the power of sin. It was just rolling him over and over and over again. In the middle of that crisis, he put up a cry. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will save me from this body of death? My mind has changed. My heart has changed. I have been redeemed and I have a desire in the inward man to follow and pursue the law of God, but my body is not cooperating. My body's not redeemed and its appetites are being stirred. But who will save me from this body of death? And so at the very end of chapter 7 of Romans, in verses 24 and 25, you have in a sense, a clue to how it is that a believer moves into a life of sanctification. What we said was, Paul's initial testimony is a testimony of the gospel of salvation. How I came to an end of myself and I saw that Jesus Christ had bore all my punishment for me and I couldn't prove my own righteousness by my own work, good works. I couldn't save myself. I couldn't remove from me the penalty of my 
of my sins against myself and the judgment that my sins have brought against me because of the law and before the law. I couldn't go to that same law and now extract those sins out of my life. I had to somebody who died in my place and somebody who would give me his own righteousness and I put all my faith in him to rescue me and deliver me from the penalty of my sins and that's the gospel of salvation. What we said is following that, there's more of the gospel to be unfolded before our lives. Salvation progresses from that point on into a great work of sanctification. And there's a gospel of sanctification as well. And the gospel of sanctification is built on the same basic pattern. You can't do it in yourself. You can't do it by your own efforts. You can't go before the law and say, now that I've been saved from the penalty of my sins, I'll exert myself in order to demonstrate that I can live in, and rise above the power of sin in you. You can't do it. Even though you want to do it and you long to do it and you have a desire that's been rising up within you you've never experienced before. You can't do it in your own flesh, in your own power. You'll fail. That's what Paul did. Paul failed. And as he began to pursue that strategy, he didn't gain more and more success. He saw his sin more and more clearly, and he saw the battle of sin and flesh more and more clearly in his life. And we said this last week, that before a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ and receives his salvation, they have a, a sin problem. They're under the judgment of God for their sins. And when they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they no longer have a sin problem. It's been addressed. It's been dealt with. But now what happens for the child of God is they have a problem with sin. They don't want it in their life. They want to eradicate it, and they want to see it removed from the patterns of their behavior and their thought. And yet they discover that their body doesn't cooperate with them. And so they try hard, and they try, and they try, and they, well, they fail. Because try is not a word for your initial salvation, and try is not a word for your sanctification either. No one will ever make it to heaven because they tried and put their effort into it and gave it their best shot. And no one will live a life of holiness because they tried as well. The Lord Jesus has to bring that to you. And so there has to be, to some extent, because this is our natural pattern to rely upon ourselves, we just have to go through the process and the cycle of going into crises again. The crisis of realizing there's nothing in ourselves. And then out of that crisis, there comes a cry. Who will rescue me? Who will save me and deliver me from this body of death? And then following that, verse 25 of chapter 7, what we saw it said was, now there's a moment of composure that takes place. Right as those words are echoing in, in Paul's mind, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Immediately there comes this word of composure. He knows who the who is. The who is Jesus Christ. I praise God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's the who. He's the one who rescues us and saves us even from the power of sin. It's, it's not because you read a good self-help book. It's not because you've found the right multivitamins. It's, it's not because you've learned some good process of meditation. It's not because you've found an individual who's just a good therapist who can counsel you or you've figured yourself out. Ultimately, those things all may play a role and be helpful in learning you, helping you learn good disciplines and do good patterns, but ultimately, it's in a who. It's in Christ coming before him and using your life before him and saying, dear Jesus, I, I see I could not save myself from the penalty of sin and I know I cannot save myself or lead myself into a holy life unless, unless it's you. Give me your life and your power and exerting yourself in my life. And so he composes himself on that thought and then having composed him on that, he, he gets a moment of clarity. And in that clarity, what he sees is that he is a new creature in Christ. He is a new man in Christ. That he has been given this new mind. And we, we mentioned that the, the Greek word for the spirit of a man was pneuma, pneuma. But the faculty by which that spirit expressed itself was the noose or the mind. And Paul is basically saying, I'm a new spirit in Christ. I become a new man in Christ. And with my mind, my noose, I desire my desires and I seek to serve the law of God. That's what I am. In fact, the word he says here is, I myself, with my mind. And then he has a kind of castaway thought, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And he sees a division in his life now, but it's a helpful one. The core of his being, the central identity of who he is, his mind, his heart, his life is transformed and changed. 
and directed into the will of God and he wants to serve God with all that he has and his body is what is not in accord with that. His body has a different direction to go, but that understanding, that sense of the central identity, wanting to serve God and please God, and the declaration that Jesus is the one who delivers him from that body of death, gives him a a, a standpoint and a, a thought and a direction in which he can begin to walk out and live the Christian life with victory. And that's what he's going to talk about in Romans chapter 8. He's going to talk about that sanctified life and how the Spirit of God works with that individual who's come through that crisis and made that cry and then had that moment of composure on Christ and, and with that clarity now begins to appropriate for his life what the Spirit of God would do in and through him. So that's where he's at. That's where, we're at. That's where we've come to the passage and so now Paul, in chapter 8, begins to give us the answer of how it is that we begin to walk out this Christian life and how we find victory over sin and over temptation and how it is that we consistently begin to develop patterns of holiness and righteousness in our life. And this is where we're at. He begins to give the answer in verse 8. So let's start right there. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. We'll see here, by the way, it says, There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Some of your translations do not have this last phrase, although you'll find it in the King James and the New King James, where it says, Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And that is uh, in most of the New Testament transcripts or that were written. And the oldest ones, that phrase is omitted because it's like a scribal error in which they took that same phrase from verse 4, and they put it at the end of verse 1. But it actually begins, it belongs at verse 4. So actually the verse should read like this. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation to those. And this is where Paul begins to walk out a life of victory. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's our first point. Your victory over the weakness and the sinful tendencies of your flesh and its inability to keep the law of God begins with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your ability to live a holy life begins with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is something what we've been saying. Romans 8 is this really wonderful chapter that begins with this declaration that there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. And then at the very end of the chapter, we're told there's no separation from the love of Jesus Christ. There's no separation from Jesus Christ. And in the middle of the chapter, it says that God works to get all things together for good who love him and are called according to his purpose. How about that for a chapter? Starts with no condemnation, ends with no separation. In the middle says God is going to work everything out for your good. If you love him, you're called according to his purpose. It's a, it's a letter that we, and it's a, a chapter we should want to spend a lot of time in and Chapter 8 basically begins to relate to us the, the strategy or the basis or the starting point from which we battle and defeat the expressions of sin that rise up within our body and our flesh. Chapter 7, you'll remember, as you read it, you go back and read it again, you'll see that it's full with a lot of I and me and the references himself. And now when Paul gets to Romans chapter 8, he, he turns the language from just himself and he speaks of those who are in Jesus Christ. He directs it to all. And now he's, he's, in a sense, there's a humility here. When he describes the struggle and battle with sin, he just talks about himself. He doesn't point at anybody else, but those who are reading it can identify with it. You should. It's a good thing if you can identify this struggle in your own life. If you've given your life to Christ, it's a good thing if you can identify the discovery and the struggle to, of your own flesh and against sin and the temptation and the trials and even your failures as you tried and tried harder it's good you either have you you're either in the midst of the crisis or you recognize it because you've come through it i wish one or the other for you i wish you've come through it or i hope you're in it paul is sharing his own story in a personal way but those who are reading can identify with it but now when paul comes to the answer now he opens it up fully to them there is no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. It's, it's for all of us. And he's bringing and he's sharing openly and straight and directly, not from his own experience, but now for all that are listening to him, all that are around the table, all that are listening to what he's sharing, that here is the basis on which we, and here is the starting point for the believer to come into a consistent life of victory over the defeating nature of sin and death that roils in their own bodies. And This is the starting point. 
Victory spreads to our lives from the starting point of the cross of Jesus Christ. And in particular, the forgiveness that was won for us there at the cross. And I just remember here that you did not win your forgiveness. Jesus did. He's the victor. The starting point of our living a holy life and being set fully free from the legal penalty of sins is through Jesus Christ himself. Uh, Linsky, actually, when he translates this passage, says that it actually says, not one condemnation remains for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not one. Not one point of condemnation. The power to live the holy life begins with the power that was exerted to wash us from our sins. It begins at the cross and the work that was accomplished for us there through the Spirit-filled sacrifice of Jesus Christ and His Spirit-filled resurrection. Actually, let's, let's read the next verses after that. It says in verse 2, For the law of the Spirit, here it is, For the law or force of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law or the force or the principle of sin and death. For what the law, now speaking of the Ten Commandments, could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. And here what Paul is saying is the starting point from which we live out that life of walking in the Spirit is when Christ came in the fullness of the Spirit to offer up a perfect sacrifice for us. And when Christ rose from the dead to, to deliver to us a perfect righteousness. And so our victory over sin begins in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the second point. It's this. Listen, Christians. The struggle with the flesh and your faltering in the flesh, the fact that you struggle in your flesh to do the right thing, and at times you falter and you fail and you stumble does not bring you under any further condemnation. As you're learning the lesson that I can't live this Christian life in my own power, and you're going to learn it at times by falling flat on your face. You're going to learn it because you're, you'll discover, here's how you discover that you're living in the flesh instead of in the spirit, because your flesh will fail you. And it'll fail you in anger and malice and sin and impatience and... It blows up in your face. Here's the good news. When it does, you've given your life to Jesus. You've trusted in Him as your Savior. You've received Him as the one who's bore your sins before the Father and took the punishment of God's wrath against your sin. You've received Christ as the righteousness who covers you in His righteousness. Your sins are forgiven and you are not under any more condemnation. None. You've not added condemnation to your life. Every sin of the believer, past, present, future, has been brought under the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're free from its condemnation. You don't go forward, we don't go forward to obey God's law and do good works in order to stave off any further condemnation in our life. God, thank you for getting rid of the condemnation in my past, and now I'll work really hard to make sure I don't add any more. No, we don't do that. It's, it's, all, it's all under the blood of Jesus Christ. We go forward not to stave off condemnation. We don't go forward in order to somehow sequester for ourselves more acceptance from God or that God would receive us or that God would favor us. We're not seeking to purchase some greater ground in heaven for ourselves. It's all been ours. It's all been given to us. Because of Jesus Christ and what He's done for us, we are, we are completely and utterly free from condemnation. Completely. We go forward into obedience because... We've been saved from all condemnation. We're not living to alleviate or to lessen or avoid judgment in our lives. We now live in the exaltation of the undeserved, freely given salvation that comes to us by faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's what it means to live from the point of grace. I'm not under condemnation. What a relief. What a removal of a kind of, of un healthy motivation for living and seeking to live a godly life, proving myself again and again to God, showing God that now, now that you've saved me, I'm, I can show you that I can be worthy of your salvation. Not possible. From beginning to end. 
Now I'll just work really hard so no shadow comes over me and I don't have any more stains on my life and I'll try to keep myself as, as clean as I can and there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. None. When you falter and you fail and you stumble, here's a word that comes to you. I don't condemn you. I don't. I don't condemn you. Now that's not what Satan does. Satan is tracking you after you come to faith in Jesus Christ. He's following after your effort and the way you're going to live and the, what you do. And then Satan is going to entice you into sin. And he's going to fan the energies of your flesh. And he's going to appeal to that flesh. And then when you, when you fail, he's going to bring to you a voice of condemnation. He's going to say, ha, you think you're saved? You're not. You haven't changed at all. You're still in your sins. And you need to stop fighting it and just be who you are. Or he'll come and say, you know what? Actually, if you're really going to be a Christian, you're going to have to take matters in your own hands and you're just going to have to do your best and try really hard and maybe you'll get better than other individuals and then you're just going to have to leave it there. Just try your best. That should be enough. Whatever the tactical argument is that Satan puts against you, his plan is to turn us away from the gospel. It's to turn us away from the understanding that Christ has finished and completed everything necessary for us to stand and live before God and be received by Him. It's, it's to turn us from a complete trust in all that Christ has done and turn us back into the strategies of the past in which we just try and we just try. And no, we don't have to listen to Satan. We don't have to bow to it. Instead, I see that from beginning to end, my life as a Christian is completely carried out in a full and complete and surrendered trust in the person of Jesus Christ. It's grace. It's living from grace. It's drinking in the grace of Jesus Christ for my life from beginning to end. And I actually think oftentimes in the church, Satan has won his propaganda to get us to go back to a life of try, and a life of do your best and it's oftentimes expressed because the gospel doesn't become central in the church anymore. You get in pulpits and you have pastors that spend their time giving you strategies on how to manage your days and how to deal with stress and you know, giving it's actually practical advice on how to get along with your wife. And I know all of us at times need to get kind of advice like that or what to do to raise our kids better or how to have a more peptic attitude towards the difficulties that you face in life or whatever it is. And all these things get piled up like a, a, a boundary of ethics of how we're to live and how we're to conduct ourselves. And, and then what happens is uh, we begin to, and any time this happens, in the church, we begin to fight among one another and we begin to bear offenses against one another. And all of it demonstrates and shows that we're not living our lives, not approaching our fellowship before one another, centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ which Christ took sin upon himself and died for us. When you take measures for your own, uh, and when you are seeking to somehow establish your own moral superiority, and then you take measurements of your moral superiority or your spiritual maturity, and you compare it to others, you're, you're defaulting in your life away from the gospel of an exchange life in Jesus Christ. But when you fail to be merciful, you're forgetting that the gospel is a gospel given only to those who are recipients of God's profound mercy. When you fail to be gracious with others, when you fail to see that when you do that and you're not being gracious with other individuals, how could they ever do? Who would do something like that? You're demonstrating that you've forgotten that you live every single day in the grace of Jesus Christ. When you're unwilling to forgive another individual, you fail to recognize the willingness to forgive and the provision that Christ made so that he could forgive you on the day and the moment in which you repented and turned to him. The forgiveness wasn't received by us until we reached out in repentance to take it and embrace it. But the forgiveness was always in his nailed, pierced hands, and it was extended to us fully and for ourselves as well. There are individuals we can't, in a sense, forgive because they haven't asked it for us, but our disposition has to be the same way. Every provision has been made for it. It's in our hands. It's extended to them because it's in the hand of our Savior he was ever extended to us before we ever came to it and received it. When we don't live in forgiveness towards others, the real issue is not what they've done to you. It's not the offense they've caused you. It's not, well, if you only knew. It's you've forgotten the gospel. You're not living and centering ourselves in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
When we default to working to prove ourselves before God to gain any kind of favor or position, or to prove to others that we are really good people, then we are defaulting away from the fact that Jesus Christ has done all for us and that in and of ourselves there dwells no good thing. Here's what the gospel tells me. I'm depraved in my body, and I will remain depraved in my body until the day when I'm resurrected and I'm given a glorified body. And in this body, the only way that I'm going to overcome the impulse and raging elements of sin in this body is I need to rely completely and trust completely in the power of Jesus Christ. This body must be handed over and placed in His hands so that He can rule and exercise His domain over me completely as I yield to Him. But here is the answer. When we begin to live humbly, mercifully, graciously, forgivingly, dependently upon the power of Christ, uh, we then begin to demonstrate that we are living in the freedom that comes because we are not under condemnation. We are not pursuing freedom. We are not trying to be righteous. We are living in the freedom and righteousness that He gives us. And so let's go on to another point here. Let's look at another thing here. It's number three here. You'll not appreciate the impact of the gospel of Jesus Christ on your life Get this, number three. You'll not appreciate the impact of the gospel of Jesus Christ on your life as a Christian unless to some extent you travel through the experience of Romans chapter 7. Uh, I'd like to say we all got it. We all know this lesson, so we're good and we're just going to live it out. But the fact is the default of our nature is to rely upon ourselves. You would never have come to Christ for a saving grace in your life to forgive you from the penalty of your sins, if at some point in time you'd finally come to profoundly, stunningly see that you had nothing in yourself of merit to present before God, and you will not begin to rely upon the Lord Jesus Christ to live out His holy life in you until you come to see, profoundly see, that in your flesh there dwells no good thing. And so, you're going to have to go through this crisis. One way or another, God is going to have to show it to you. The story will add up differently in different people's lives. The encounter and the way that God brings it to them and brings in that realization will be expressed in different ways, but... You're going to have to come to recognize at some point in time that Jesus Christ has to do it all the way. You'll, not, you'll have to accept, even as a born-again child of God, that your flesh is not redeemed, that in the flesh you're still depraved as ever, that you and your own power cannot dress up that flesh to make it more presentable to God, that your life must be ruled instead and lived out through the gracious outpouring of what Christ freely gives you of Himself. But when you see that in yourself, when you see in your flesh that there dwells no good thing, when you recognize by experience that your own efforts will to better yourself will only produce further and further failure in your heart and your life. It'll only make you, even when you're succeeding, you'll discover all of a sudden in the midst of your success that you're becoming judgmental and you're becoming self-righteous, you're becoming superior, you're becoming proud in your success. And then you'll know where your success came from. Only then will you fall back on Christ. When you see that this is true too. I'll just do my best. I'll show that I can do it. But here's the one thing you can't do by your flesh. You can't love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul in your flesh. You can't do it. And in your own flesh, you can't ultimately get to a point where you love your neighbor as yourself. No, what? That can only be produced by the Spirit of God. And until you come to that and recognize that, you will not come to Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and see that it's a point of consistent, ongoing joy and triumph and comfort and hope. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The fact is, at some point in time, the Christian can gloss it over and read it, and they can forget it. The gospel will lose its currency and its power and its delight if they begin to rely upon their own flesh and their own activity and their own works and their own labor and 
their superior thoughts and their superior ideas. You know, you could get proud about your theological insights and all these things, and then you'll read through it and you'll, you'll be able to break it down theologically, but you won't find comfort or joy in it. You'll read right over it. You won't see that this is the starting point of the Christian life. No condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. Well, this means to some extent that, among other things, for us as Christians, we have to kind of always be updating our testimonies. We can't just go back to, well, I walked an aisle way back when. And we can't be updating the testimony with, with just, I've done a lot of good things since then. That's not an updated testimony. That's going backwards in your testimony. Your updated testimony will be, as you've received Jesus Christ, your Lord, so walk in Him, from Colossians 2.6. Your updated testimony has to be something like this. I came to an end of myself. I repented of my own effort and my own trials and my own thinking of what I thought I was. I turned my mind to see that everything was not, nothing was in myself and everything was in Jesus Christ. And now your updated testimony needs to be this. I'm living out that life and that same disposition of mind. And oh, I forgot, but God has, in a crisis, brought me back to it. And God will bring you back to it again and again and again. Your testimony gets updated as God begins to express this truth to you and you grow and you grow and you develop in holiness. So for the believer, there's a need for us to constantly be updating our testimony by taking our lives and our minds through this process. I, I remember when I was in Bible college, I had a professor, my freshman year in Bible college, tell the story, just a little make-believe story of a man who periodically gave his testimony of having been saved in some, uh, some evangelical a meeting, some gospel meeting where he'd gone down to the altar and given his life to Christ. And so periodically he was called upon to give his testimony of this dramatic moment in which he gave his life to Christ. And, and then he would go up and he'd put it in the attic. He had, had it all written out and he'd put the testimony in a little chest that he had up in his attic. And he was asked to share his testimony after a number of years and he went up to get it. And he found that some mice had got into that chest and they'd shredded it to pieces and they'd made a little bed for themselves in it. So if you're just given the same old testimony... And you're drawing back on the past, and that's where it is. And you've done your own thing since then, and you've built your own life, and you've proved what a good Christian you are. You're just going to be, your testimony is just going to be a bed for rodents. I want a testimony that's an expression of my life being empowered and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, producing in me through Jesus Christ what I could never produce in my own power, in my own strength, and well... God's going to have to take you through some crises so that you'll have a cry, so you'll learn to compose yourself entirely upon Him. And He'll do it. And then give you further clarity from there. Here's the fourth one. This will be our last point this morning. This freedom from condemnation is not found because of anything within ourselves. It is found for us in Christ it says, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. The message, the report, the, the resounding comfort of the fact that I don't have condemnation doesn't come to me when I'm out in the extremities trying to prove myself. It's when I come back and I recognize that I've been placed in Jesus Christ. It's in Him. Let's think about that for a moment. You have the story of the flood and the ark in Noah's day. Just this last week, my daughter posted something. You know, I'm not a big social media fan, and I never listen. To, I, I see my, some of my kids will post things on social media, and even when I look, I never listen to what they're saying. For whatever reason, I decided I'll, I'll listen in to what my youngest daughter was saying. And she was talking about reading the story of Noah's Ark, and she'd made a discovery that she said blew her mind, right? She made this wonderful discovery that way back in the Ark, there was this little door that was put in the Ark, and she, and that they had to go through that door to get into the ark. And in her mind, what she said was that she realized that that, that was like a foreshadowing of God. It revealed that in the mind of God, way back when he was bringing his judgment on the earth with a flood that, that wiped out the human population at that time, that God was planning and God was designing and God was foreshadowing a moment when he would, he would save all people through the doorway of Jesus Christ. And that Jesus is the door. And she, she shared that verse that's found in John chapter 10, verse 9, where Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters in by me, he will be saved. And she's, kids, this is incredible. That God was planning it way back then. 
And he was beginning to lay the framework through which we'd understand that Jesus is the door. It's good, isn't it? It's wonderful. Let's go a little bit further than that. Let's build on that idea. He's not only the door. He's the ark. (laughs) He is the ark. We don't just go in through him into salvation. We go into him for our salvation from God's wrath against sin. And when that ark was built, you remember when it was done being built, that it was God who gave the invitation. First he gave the instructions on how to build it. And then it was God who gave the invitation. God said, Noah, you and your family come into the ark. And then when they got into the ark, we're, we're told in Genesis chapter 7, verse 16, that the Lord shut him in. The Lord closed him. The Lord sealed him into it. So he was secure and he was safe in the ark from the wrath and the judgment that was about to be poured out. And Jesus is our ark. We haven't somehow gained our salvation for ourselves in any way. We have just come into all that he is and we don't hold ourselves within him. We're in him. God secures us in himself. So our safety and assurance and our security is found in him, which by the way, if you want to know what the great themes of Romans 8 are, they're sanctification and security. (laughs) Those are the two great themes of this chapter. And, And you won't realize one without the other. You won't live in the sanctifying graces of God unless you're confident that you're living in the security that Christ has provided for you. So this statement we're reading is a declaration of security. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are Jesus Christ. You're in the ark. You falter. You fail. Your flesh betrays you. You tried it in yourself and you realize it doesn't work. You've gone through the crisis. You've cried out, God, who's going to save me from this body that's still raging with sin? And you stepped out of yourself and you said, God, who who will deliver me? And God reminds you, Jesus Christ, is he not the deliverer? Has he not been your savior? Has he not rescued you? There's no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. Were you trying to drive off condemnation from yourself by your effort, not knowing that the work had been completed in him alone, that I placed you in him? What comfort. What comfort. John Phillips, considering the story of Noah, writes this. God did not say to Noah once the ark was finished, Now, Noah, I want you to take eight spikes and drive them into the outside timbers of the ark so long as you and your family Hang on, you'll be saved. But once you let go, you'll all be lost. No, Phillips continues, God shut him in. What it meant for Noah, he writes, to be in the ark is what it means for us to be in Christ. In him, God has placed us in a sphere where his wrath can never reach us. And we are as secure as Christ can make us. And oh, He makes us secure. There is no condemnation for sin in Him. Do we sin? Yeah. Do we try in our own effort and fail? Yes. Do we find in our flesh no good thing still? Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Is there condemnation for the person who has put their faith in Jesus Christ? Not at all. Not at all. And that becomes the starting point for this glad, exuberant life that brings glory and honor to him. That gets me out of the way from trying to prove myself so that I can let the fountain of the life, the freely given life of the Spirit, begin to pour itself through me to bring glory and honor to his name. This is the gospel of our salvation. And it's from this point that we live out the gospel of our sanctification. Victory over the power of sin begins just here. It begins with resting in Christ who has accomplished at the cross and all that he has accomplished at the cross and what he has provided in his resurrection power. I choose his salvation over my own. I choose his power over my own. I choose his life over my own. I choose his spirit over my fleshly energies. I rest in him. Let's bow our heads and let's pray.